Well, hi friends, we are on lesson two this week, The Authentic Woman Walks Wisely. I don't know about you, but driving sometimes can be a very dangerous activity. True confession, I had come upon a stoplight and I was waiting in my car and I went to check a text. And I have to say that the text was not a text that I needed to read at that point and I was very distracted. So distracted that the car behind me was honking for me to go. And so as I was pulling out to turn left, concerned about people honking behind me and the text that I just read, I didn't notice the car that was turning in and um, almost hit me. And I was the one honking at him. And I came away from that situation relieved that nothing had happened, but also re realizing that you gotta pay attention when you're driving on the road, not just to the external things that you see when you're driving, but also to the internal things as that text had prompted some things that were going on in my mind. And I think that this is a great example of, I think what Matthew is writing in the book of Matthew, that very much like driving, sometimes walking in our faith journey can be dangerous activity as well. That there are a lot of distractions that we come upon in our faith walk that can create um, places where we can run into problems and, and hardships and unnecessary things if we had just been paying attention to the road. And we saw that last week when Peter had walked on water and when he took his eyes off of Jesus, we saw him sink and fall. And that is really a great picture for us as well. And I think that this season, we've been talking a lot about this season, why? Because there are so many distractions right now for Christians that are causing us to take our eyes off of um, the destination and onto the uh, and onto Jesus, we're more concerned about other drivers and um, honking at other drivers and making sure that other people are driving like us. And what we're seeing is just a faith that's been fueled more by fear and self righteousness and bitterness and even some of that divisiveness. And and I think that Matthew is and these two chapters are going to give us a big picture of what does it look like to walk wisely, to follow Jesus wisely, to be paying attention to the roads that we're on because there's so much right now that is wanting to take our eyes off of the destination and the purpose that God has for us um, when we're not seeking Him. And, you know, COVID is not the problem. COVID is just highlighting the problems of this world or the potholes in our faith walk. But I'm excited because I believe more than ever that those problems are the very opportunities that God is teaching us and showing us and, and how to navigate these challenges in a safe manner. And it's the gospel that really fuels our ability to trust God in where he is taking us. So we talked a little bit last week of what trusting God looks like, especially when we're in storms and difficult seasons, but also it's getting us to think bigger that trusting God is also believing that his ways are the best ways. So in order to walk wisely, we have to lean not on our own understanding, our perception of things or how we're looking at things, but we're really growing our dependence on Jesus and how his word is what guides us and directs us and keeps us from running into trouble. So quick background as we go into chapter 16 and 17, you know that Jesus is, there's a kind of a mood change in the text. Jesus is preparing his disciples for the inevitable, that he is going to be going towards the cross to die for the sins of all of mankind, and that three days la later he would be resurrected. Um, now, of course, they're clueless about that this is really going to take place for Jesus. They do know the Torah. They do know the prophecies that prophesied of exactly who and how this Messiah would come. But we see in their faith in chapter 16 that the disciples are still at a place that they're believing only with the things that they understand or that they're comfortable with. And I think this is very common for us today. Jesus is wanting to be under the radar so that 
not to entice any more opposition. He's silent, and we see as the hostility is growing that Jesus is withdrawing more and more with his disciples to teach them. And, and we see him just exhorting and cautioning his disciples to the potential dangers that await them. And I think as we look through and read through and as you work through your lesson this week, we really need to step back and see these warnings as um, warnings for us as well. Things to be careful for, ways that we need to be paying attention to the road that we're driving and the types of distractions that are going to take our eyes off of the road and potentially cause danger and harm. And it's really that picture, if you have kids, you know, it's, it's how we seek as parents to protect our kids and we put those boundaries up for them and, and more than anything, we want to be safe and we want to equip them in how to navigate wisely their world and the decisions that they're having to make. And it's the same heart, but much bigger, that God has for us as, as Jesus is, as, our, as, as God is our Father, and we are his daughters, he wants us to be wise because he doesn't want us to put ourselves in situations that are gonna have um, consequences and potential dangers. So it's no different for us. And I love this verse, I was thinking about this, this verse in Re uh, Colossians 1, 10 through 12, and it says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thank thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. And I love that because the way that we are called to, to be wise as disciples and to follow, follow God is to walk in a way that is like Christ, that is pleasing to Christ. And when we ensure that those things are happening in our faith walk, then we're going to participate and share in the inheritance and the blessings and the abundance that comes when we are obeying, trusting and obeying God. But these warnings and, and, and cautions that Jesus gives his disciples are things that we need to pay attention to. So I want to kind of break up chapter 16 and look through some of those and pull out some application that you can further discuss in your group time. But when you read through chapter 16, verses 1 through 12, what we see is this picture as the religious leaders are coming and testing Jesus. They are really asking Jesus for, for signs. They're demanding signs to prove that he is the Messiah. And they're wanting him to explain some of these miracles away that they weren't really miracles empowered by something greater. It was just a coincidence or it was the use of evil power. Now the Sadducees and Pharisees, the religious people, knew that through the Old Testament, through the Torah, that the Messiah would come. But in their mind, this Messiah was not who Jesus was. They were looking for someone that was going to deliver them physically from the oppression, be more of a military leader, um, someone that would restore their kingdom, that they would reign once again as that great kingdom. And this was not who Jesus was. Jesus was humble. Jesus was going after not just the religious people, but the marginalized and the Greeks and the Gentiles and, and the Jews. And in their minds, that's not who they thought the Messiah would be. And Jesus, I love this because he refused to waste time in pressing them because he knew that even a miracle would not convince them of who he was. Even those signs would not convince them of who he was. And I think it's really a great observation because I think so many people today want to see a miracle so that they can believe that Jesus is God, the Son of God. But even with those miracles, people still choose to not believe and um, put their faith in him. Because, he, you know, prior chapters, we see him feeding 5,000 people. He's raising people from the dead. If that 
was not enough evidence to change their minds that this was the promised Messiah that had entered history to restore them, maybe differently than how they thought, then there would be no miracle or sign that would be great enough for them. So John 20, 29 says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So Jesus in these chapters is, is teaching and expanding this idea of what faith is and what faith is not. And we see through the Pharisees and the Sadducees that it was their pride and stubbornness that would prevent them from seeing the ways God wanted to reveal himself miraculously um, in their lives. Because they were looking for signs to affirm maybe their lifestyle or their belief system or their religiosity. And, and God wanted to show them that the sign that they, signs that they were looking for were not the signs that he had come to fulfill. He actually was coming to fulfill even something greater, a greater need that they had, and that was that they would be set free from all of those things. Um, so that's, that's, I think, a warning for us is just to be aware that sometimes we have expectations about what we want God to do or how we want him to perform or how we want to see prayer answered. And really what God is looking for is that we would trust him that, that um, who he is and what he has said that he would do in our life, those promises of scripture, even though we may not see them being fulfilled in this moment, that that's the kind of faith that he's wanting to develop in us. Those are the signs that he's already given us, and that's in his word. And we have to take steps to believe that those will come to fulfillment as he fulfills those in our life. So the second part in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, I think this is so timely, especially in the day that we're living in, is, it, is the warning to make sure that you are following and believing in the fullness of Jesus. Jesus says in those verses that in John 8, 58, Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is establishing his identity and his deity as God that he is the one that God was bringing into history to be that Messiah that would not just save the Jews, but would save all people from, from sin. And so Jesus asked his disciples who they thought he was. Their response was no different than how many respond as they hear about Jesus as this kind of historical figure, or maybe a great teacher, or a healer, or a magician. But we see earlier, after Peter had walked on water, he asked Peter who he was, and Peter, in that moment, said that he was Christ. He was the son of the living God. And it was perfect. Peter's confession of his faith in Christ as the I am was unwavering, and his theology was sound. And Peter affirmed that and told him that he would be the rock. He praised, he praised Peter. And what I love about this part is that Peter's confession of who Jesus was strengthened his confidence in his identity of who he was going to be. And I think that's a great application for us is to make sure that we fully know who Jesus is and, and that he is the great I am. And to be wise in making sure that we are putting all of our faith in one person and not putting some of it in Jesus and the rest of it in all these other people. Our hope cannot be in people. It cannot be in leaders. It cannot be in pastors and teachers and all the different people that we follow sometimes on social media. There's only one I am, and that is Jesus. And, um, and Matthew is wanting us to, to establish that identity in Jesus as the great I am, but also knowing that when we know that Jesus is the great I am, it strengthens our identity and who we are in Christ. We are a new creation, and, and our viewpoint of Jesus informs us of our viewpoint of ourselves. 
And so it's a great question sometimes when we are in a season where our identity maybe is distracted from Jesus and it's, it's on other things and other people and what the world says about us. It's just, just a reminder that we've gotten off course a little bit and we're putting it in the wrong things. And so the best way to kind of course correct and get back on the road is to establish once again that only Jesus is a great I am and to put your identity in him. The third thing I think is interesting in Matthew 16, and we see that in verses 21 through 23, is that Jesus is really wanting his disciples to begin to see things from his point of view instead of their point of view. Um, it, says, it says in verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be, be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, we see here that the disciples are still not grasping that Jesus' true purpose, because of how scripture had prepared the disciples and prepared the religious leaders was that he was the Messiah that scripture was pointing to and that he had to go to the cross and fulfill this redeeming plan that God had for humanity. He, and that his disciples' comfort and his, the disciples' feelings and the disciples' potential grief over Jesus going to the cross was not going to thwart God's ultimate plan for mankind. But it's interesting how prior to that, Peter was all in. He believed Jesus was the one. He knew he was the Messiah. And we see, gosh, what happened between that point in Peter's faith and what happened in this point when, when Peter is telling Jesus that he can't fulfill that part of, um, the, of God's plan. And, and I think it's just a, a, a reminder of, of our faith walk that it is so easy to be all in with Jesus, but we can also be all out with Jesus when we get distracted by some of the, the things that are on the side of the road. And I don't know what's on the side of your road, but I know what's on the side of my road. And sometimes for me, it's I'm fearful or I'm afraid or I'm worried or I care what people think or I'm distracted by the news or I'm worried about my future. And the minute I take my eyes off of how God is working, what God has promised he will do, even in seasons like this, then I began to um, limit myself in being part of how God wants to work in and through me. And so I just think that's another warning for us to, to remember. And also, just to be honest, you know, do we have any preconceived ideas of who Jesus is? Do we have the proper view of God in our life? Is he first place? Do we understand his whole purpose in sending his son to begin with. Um, and I think part of walking wisely is identifying those potholes of unbelief that we might have in our, in our walk. And if we know what they are, then we can trust God to kind of work some of those out in his timing um, and not be derailed when they hit us in these unexpected times. And then Matthew 16, 24, as we kind of wrap up that last part of the chapter, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And this is, I think this is a hard part of scripture to, to, to really take in, but it's something that we have to talk about and think through and commit to. But he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life will, for me will find it. And Jesus is having this real moment 
with his disciples and he's basically coming to this fork in the road that all of us have to decide. There's two ways you can navigate your faith. There's two paths that you can drive and one is going to be the wise and the safe and the abundant and the free path and the other is going to be the path that's going to lead you off the road, derailed, in harm's way, full of consequence and it's going to be a miserable journey. And so as, as, as Jesus was telling his disciples, still not believing that this was Jesus going to the cross. And remember, for this period, for, for you know the cross, we wear our nice crosses around our neck. We live on this side of the cross. The cross is a, a, it's, it's, um, it's the biggest gift of our life, the cross. It means so much to us. Without the cross, we would not be walking in a relationship with Jesus and walking in the freedom. But you have to remember at this time, the cross for a disciple, the cross for anyone hearing these words coming out of Jesus' mouth was, you mean the cross that Romans crucify people and burn and light as that become torches lighting up the Roman roads, that kind of cross. I mean, this must have created so much fear in them. But Jesus is giving them this picture, this future picture of what the cost that it's going to be to follow Jesus. Denying yourself instead of living for yourself, taking up the cross instead of ignoring the cross, following Christ instead of following this world, losing your life for his sake instead of saving your life for your sake, forsaking the world instead of gaining the world, keeping your soul instead of losing your soul, and sharing his reward and glory versus losing his reward and glory. And that's the decision that Christians have to make. And, uh, you know, and I think it's important in these words to realize that denying self doesn't mean to deny the things that God wants to give you. It just means to be fully, um, fully in your relationship with Christ, so much so that you'd be willing to, to share in his shame and in, in the death and in the suffering that accompanies a follower of Christ. That's the reality of what we're committing to when we put our life in the hands of Jesus and we decide to navigate the path that he has for us, that there are going to be opposing things that are going to come against us. But the beautiful thing that scripture promises is that suffering leads to glory. And and I think that that is something that I'm just praying in this season for you and for myself, that hopefully the squeezing of the season is, is making this become more and more um, something that we are not afraid of, that we're actually experiencing God in some really deep ways that maybe we didn't experience because there wasn't this kind of hardship and persecution and suffering. You know, until you've been, until you've been persecuted or for your faith or, or you've been rejected for your faith or you've been made fun of your faith, that's a part of our walk with God or Jesus that we don't experience. And we don't have to be afraid of it because Jesus has already prepared us that it's going to happen. But don't worry, because we're going to share in the glory, the glory to come, that as we fellowship with God um, in, those, in those difficult places. So I just wanted you to, to not be afraid um, of that, but it's an opportunity to just go much deeper with Jesus when you find yourself in that situation. And then chapter 17, I love how Matthew kind of continues kind of these, these warnings and these in, in, words of encouragement that as we, as we follow Jesus, we can expect not a smooth road, but a road that is going to be marked with the glory of, of Christ. And it's not by accident that we see the transfiguration in chapter 17, which is where God and Jesus identify that relationship and we see just that that heart of worship that Jesus and the disciples the, the the Jesus and his friends have as they go up on that mountain and to see all aspects of the glory of Christ the glory of in his person the glory in the kingdom the glory of the cross and the glory in his submission to the will of the father 
and um, and that's a picture of what's going to come when Jesus is resurrected. And he gives that little insight to um, to his disciples to show them that to prove to him beyond a shadow of a doubt that that he is the Messiah but also to give a picture of us of what glory looks like and what we can expect in our, in our own walk with him. And then finally in chapter 17, we end with just this beautiful picture of faith. You're familiar with the verse, you know, that it just takes a, a mustard seed of faith to, to move the mountains, the impossibilities that we find in our life. And I would imagine as you're studying and reading Matthew that you're bringing some of those mountains into the text. You're, you're asking the Lord, I don't know how to navigate this. This is a hard place to follow you. I don't know if I want to lay down this. I don't know if I want to pick up this. I'm struggling with um, how Christians are behaving. I'm distracted by my circumstances. And faith is definitely a theme. And I think what Matthew is wanting us to realize is those things that we're facing are not impossible for God to work in and move in. And all God is asking us is to refocus our eyes off of the mountains and off of the things that are overwhelming us and just take that energy, take that time and commit to strengthening our faith in him, spending that time with Jesus, getting to know him. You can't trust someone that you don't know really well. And, um, you know, Jesus rebukes the disciples for, for not having the kind of faith that they needed to heal the, the demonized boy that was, that was dying and the father had come to his disciples first and then he went to Jesus. But he also, this is a challenge for us that sometimes we need to be rebuked for the lack of faith that we have that God wants to do in us. We need to not trust in our own abilities but believe in the abilities that God has placed within us you know that it's it's in Christ that we're strengthened not in ourselves and hopefully that encourages you in some of the the mountains you, you may be facing this week um, to refocus your your energy and your faith and put it on the one who knows exactly where you're driving to as you begin to take greater steps to trust him. So walking wisely, let me just kind of recap, is making small decisions each day to keep focused on your journey and the signs that God has for you in your life. To recognize that Jesus is the only great I am, to put aside all of the people that you're turning to and following and deepening your trust in God, following him, liking him, and creating followers of Jesus Christ, not followers of you. See things from God's view and not your own. You know, this world is crazy, but sometimes I just have to get out of this world and go, God, how are you looking at it? And when I open up the, uh, the word and I begin to read scripture, the scripture has already prepared and informed me for how to look at everything that we're going through right now. And that's the exciting part of what we're doing as we're in Bible study is developing that, that perspective. Losing your life so you can find it, laying down those things that you're holding on to and surrendering and asking God's will to be done in your life. Recognizing that Jesus is the Son of God, that you now, because of the death and resurrection of Christ, you have access to God, the creator of the universe, that should compel you every day, first and foremost, to be a worshiper of Him, to adore Him to as you spend time with Him in the private place, as you go up onto that mountain and, and spend time and contemplate his glory. First Corinthians, it talks about that as we contemplate God's glory, we actually begin to reflect that glory to the world. And that is what people need right now. And then I would just say, hey, if you have a little bit of faith right now, then take those steps to grow in that little bit of faith right now. And don't worry about the ways that you don't have faith. Just start where you do, and God is going to grow that in due time. You can trust him. Praying for you, friend. Have a great discussion with your group. Dig into those questions, and um, I look forward to talking to you next week. Bye-bye.